gonna take a minute and pray, and then we're gonna worship. So God, we just thank you. Thank you for the chance to come together, God, as your family, as your children, to come before your presence. Holy Spirit, we ask that you would release your manifest presence. God, I ask that you would open up our eyes, open up our eyes to see you as you are. We ask God, release your light, release your truth. In Jesus' name, amen.
my comfort God you are the source of my joy You are the source of my provision You are the source of my life You are good Very present help in trouble A very present help in trouble Yeah A very present help in trouble In time of need A very present help in trouble You are good You, you see good. me You are a very present help in trouble You are a very present help in trouble A very present help in trouble God, we lean into you this afternoon. A very present help in trouble. I lean into you. You're a very present help in trouble. You see me. I lean You're into you. A very you. present help in trouble. You know me. You care. You're a very present help in trouble. You see. Present help in trouble, you know me. I'm gonna let the truth of who you are wash over me again. I'm gonna let the truth of who you are wash over me again. I'm gonna let the truth of who you are wash over me again. I'm gonna let the truth of who you are wash over me again. The Lord is my light and my salvation. The Lord is my light and my salvation. He's faithful. The Lord is the strength of my life. Whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked came against me, when my adversaries, my enemies came against me, they stumbled and fell. Stumbled oh, and fell. You are good. You good. Oh, you are good. Good. Oh, you are good. You good. Good. You good. Oh. you you have never left me every day you put your light in my heart even in the valley still I know you're with me every day you put your light in my heart
was so shaking I could barely move I was reaching out for anything I was lost hoping you would find me you would find me then I saw you were right beside me right beside me
thank you, Lord. Just let him fill you this afternoon again. Just let him fill you with his peace. Let him fill you with his light. Let the light of your countenance shine on my heart again. Let the light of your countenance shine right into my heart again. Thank you for your presence, God. says the Lord in the rain I want to be your safety when everything is shaking keep coming back keep coming back to me I want to be your comfort in the pain I want to be your shelter in the rain. I want to be your safety when everything is shaking. Keep coming back, keep coming back to me. He says, keep coming back, keep coming back to me cause you got hurt in the journey and you got tired along the way temptation coming to drink from broken sisters but it only increases the pain Lord says, keep coming back, keep coming back to me. I want to be your comfort in the pain. I want to be your shelter in the rain. I want to be your safety when everything is shaking. Keep coming back, keep coming back to me. Keep coming back, keep coming back to me. I could be your portion again, says the Lord. I could be your inheritance again. I could be your portion again I could be your inheritance again Oh, your fountains are in me I have everything you need Keep coming back those who call upon my name, they will not be put to shame. For it is written that even the young ones grow tired and weary. 
Yes, even the young ones stumble and they fall and they faint. But those who wait, those who wait on the Lord, they get the new strength. Those who wait on the Lord will find, will gain new strength. All your fountains are in me. I have everything you need. Keep coming back to me. Those who call upon my name, they will not be put to shame. Keep coming back to me. No one wants to make things right more than you. Have it your way, do what you, you long to do. Anything can happen when you move. God, would you come and move here?
saw your name over us. Saw your name, 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 saw your name.
Spirit of wisdom Open my eyes again Spirit of revelation Open my heart again Spirit of wisdom Open my eyes again Spirit of revelation Open my heart again Cause I Wanna see God I Wanna see See you rightly Jesus Oh I Wanna see Lord I Wanna see, see you rightly, Jesus. Release the spirit of wisdom right here in this room, God. Release the spirit of revelation in the knowledge of Jesus. Come and open up our eyes. Spirit of wisdom, open my eyes again. Spirit of revelation, open my heart again. Spirit of wisdom, open my eyes again. Cause I want to see of Jesus more than my circumstances changing more than everything working out just the way I wanted to I need the revelation of Jesus I need the revelation of Jesus I need to know the beauty of Jesus I need to know the heart of i 
is white as wool I know your voice it sounds like waters Jesus you're beautiful I know it's your eyes are like flames of fire I know it's your head is white as wool I know it's your voice it sounds like waters Jesus you're beautiful I know it's your eyes are like flames of fire I know it's your head I know it's you. 
your eyes are like flames of fire. I know it's your hair as white as wool. I know it's your voice it sounds like once. Jesus, you're beautiful. I know that your eyes are like flames of fire. I know it's your hair as white as wool. I know it's your voice it sounds like once. Jesus, you're beautiful. just stay right where you are for a couple moments. That's why I was sneaking up here. I didn't want them to go back yet. Because I want to get have, have someone share a quick testimony. Then we're going to give a couple quick announcements, and then everybody's going to go to their breakouts. Some of you will be here for the Forerunner tr uh, messaging and the other different breakouts, but we want you to hear the uh, announcements first. But first, come on up here, Richie. This is Richie Bickle. He is my nephew. I'm going to have him give a quick uh, testimony because it's just, it's just uh, uh, compelling to me, just your story. You know, I came from a big family. There's seven kids in nine years. And the seven kids, right now, there are 70 people I'm related to by blood or marriage within five miles of IHOP. There's 70 of us. It's a quiet room. No, it's a giant room. And Richie is, is uh, the oldest of, the, of all the, the nieces and nephews. That's right. But he's got a strange story, a compelling story, that Richie, because he is the uh, uh, son of my youngest sister. I have five sisters, so man. I'm hi, a, Mom. Hi, Mom. She's out there somewhere. <laughs> and Mom fell into hard times, and Richie fell into hard times, and he went to prison for about three years when he was 16, 17, 18. I mean, real prison, like big people's prison. And it was like shocking to us. Then he got radically saved. And then his mother, my sister, who also went to prison, yes. and son and father, they all went to the inner city and began the IHOP inner city outreach, which is called Hope City. And you've been doing this for years. Hope City, where you at? There it is. And so my went to prison baby sister and went to prison her husband and went to prison my first nephew. So you know what the moral of the story is? What's the moral? Jesus is real. Jesus is real. All of them got radically saved. I mean radically saved, but they're down in the inner city preaching, leading a prayer room, 
an internship, but here's the part I want you to catch, just for just a quick moment here, is that Richie, some years ago, began to get gripped with this end time message. I mean, you didn't even finish high school. Eighth grade education. Eighth, except for you're one of the smartest guys around, though, actually. But still an eighth grade education. And so he started studying the prophecies of Daniel and Zechariah. And I did not know this. You became known in the IHOP community as one of the best teachers on the end times. So how does a kid live in a crazy wild lifestyle with a crazy mom and dad lifestyle, all get saved and get turned on to Jesus and the end time message? And how did this get a hold of you? Well, this got a hold of me when I just look at the world. If you look around you today, there has to be an answer for the times we live in. And the part about it being that crazy of a material is, I do have an eighth grade education, but this isn't the most difficult stuff in the Bible. Romans, to me, is much harder than the words of Jesus in Matthew 24. So, so you began to study this some years ago, and, and all of the nieces and nephews said, Richie's getting like a, becoming a preacher. And of course, I'm Uncle Mike on steroids to like 70 of them. I'm Uncle Mike, oh, Richie's becoming a preacher like you. And I said, really? And They're I'm, much more excited than I am right now, trust they, right me. Now, oh, yeah, right now, having oh, you yeah. up here, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and so, but, but you begin to study this, and so you're teaching it in the IHOP community, and you're traveling around at various ministries and teaching on the end times. What is the response, particularly of the interns and even the community in the inner city, the IHOP community, what do they think about this? So as for right now, there's a stigma coming on this message, but it's not here yet. Right now, there's a hunger for this message, which lets me know that this is the perfect opportunity to start devouring it. So there's a hunger on there's the- There's a uh, massive hunger. So they, they want to learn this. So aren't they intimidated like, hey, this is too hard, it's end times, nobody can figure out, and why At did first, you buy that line? until somebody tells them the truth. It's not that hard to figure out. There's 150 chapters of this, guys. We don't have the right to ignore them. Somebody will tell you they're too difficult, somebody will tell you they're spooky, but they're really not. Jesus is coming back. Once you have that, then the whole blueprint has been laid out for us. We are without excuse on this subject. So you're one of our leaders, uh, I mean, of our, our main leaders. We, we have a real aggressive ministry at the IHOP where we're going through these 150 chapters systematically. It's a three-year program. You're one of our main leaders in that. And so what are you finding people, how they're responding, who have never understood this before because you're leading it, are they getting it? Are they hungry they for it? They are getting it. There, there, there's, a, there's a grace on this message right now, which should send warning bells off in our head. And, what, and what's the warning bells that the that grace... That there's coming a time there won't be a grace, that there will be a stigma. And right now is the perfect you opportunity. You mean a stigma on the message? On the message, yeah. Well, you tell somebody Jesus is coming back. You tell a Christian that and, and watch the look on their face. Which is what? Talk about something else, please. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. You mean That's you don't find them saying, wow, they go like, no, oh, come they go, on. Yeah, of course he is, but it's not coming anytime soon. That's because they haven't read these chapters, and they're not able to look at this blueprint. The chapters of the 150 chapters 150 in the Bible. chapters in the Bible. So you travel around and speak at different places on this, and why have you grabbed this instead of other areas as your focus? Because this generation needs it. Because for 2,000 years, the church has ignored it, and it's not okay anymore. And so as a guy, you're an intercessor, you're, tra you're reaching people in the inner city, you're an evangelist, you're, you're shepherding people out there, and you're training in this. What would you say to these folks? This is maybe new ideas to them. These 150 chapters in the Bible on the subject, what would you say to them? Just a, a few moments and then we're gonna move Jesus on. Jesus is coming back. Let's have our announcement. That's today. it, Jesus is coming back and you don't have the right to ignore that fact. As Christians, we need to get on board with our glory is coming in the future. It could be the soon future or it could be a little bit later. But if you look around, it would say sooner than later probably. We do not get the right to ignore that information and we have to pass it on to the next generation if it's not ours. And so uh, I love your passion for this and who would have I known? Love your Again, I got like 50 nieces and nephews and grand nieces and nephews. At least about 95 of them probably. Yeah, and you're like the oldest one and I am so proud of you, man. You really that doing the stuff. And, and so. Some of you out there, you might say, hey, we would like to have a seminar at our church or our university Bible study. You'd be, you got your email address right there. Would you be Bam. willing to travel a little bit and go? Yeah, I'd, I'd go to the ends of the earth to say that Jesus is coming back. That so, is glorious. And so this message, you're, you're not going to draw back and I'm start not drawing back. candy coating? No, nope, there, there will be no sugar if you have me at your church to talk about this. <laughs> okay, bless Zero you. sugar. <laughs> Zero God sugar. God bless you. Bless you. A couple quick announcements. <laughs>
I love that guy. Yeah, okay. well, you and him are buddies. Yeah, right? we're buddies. That I haven't seen such, such zeal and true integrity that he walks what he says. Well, he's got that straightforward, no nonsense style. That's right. He's like bold. trying to put a little sugar in. He, <laughs> a little bit. I, I yeah. do. Not a, I need to put more. No, he's but there's good. Ruben and Elrenda. They've been our host last year. So just give us the announcements, what's coming up. I know John Thurlow is going to be leading tonight at 7 o'clock. That's correct, yes. And then we have the night watch at 10 to 12 for four hours. We're going down to the prayer room, and Misty's leading the first uh, two hours. That's right. Okay, tell us the rest of the announcements. So, yes, I want to highlight John Thurlow's new album, Different Story. How many of you guys enjoyed John Thurlow's worship today? Come on, that was awesome. So this album is really special. It was written over the course of a three-year journey that he was on with the Lord, and it's really, really powerful. It speaks of redemption, trial, and hope. Um, I've been personally listening to it on repeat for the last four weeks, and my favorite song is number eight, The Power of Your Love. It's got kind of like 80s, 90s. Feel you say it. you love listening to his stuff. I do. I, I love really listening really to you talk. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. I love your accent. I know it's from South Africa, man. I told you the truth. Anyway, Whoa. so it's a South African accent. I love it. Yeah, I just, yeah. Elrinda, keep talking. Okay, well, we'll, we'll do. <laughs> well, we also want to help you take uh, the next step in your journey. Uh, I just want to add oh, to that. Sure. We've got something special. Um, not only is different story available in CD format, but it's also available in, wait for it, vinyl and cassette tape. Okay, when is the last time you had a cassette tape? Okay, so head on over to the bookstore <laughs> and get that. For those millennials who don't know what that is, it's, it's just another audio way, a way of listening to music in an analog manner. <laughs> so, <laughs> so anyway, so we also want to help you in your journey. Take the next step in your journey and your walk with the Lord. We want to invite you to our hub. In fact, at 445, our, our Terry Terry, Dr. Terry Terry, she is, helps give leadership along with Jay Thomas to our music academy. Uh, she's going to give a, a talk on how you can experience God's presence through song. And so don't miss that at 4.45 right here outside the It's only of the like a 10-minute little, little insight and then a Q&A time. That's right. It's 10, 12 minutes, yeah. Now, our music academy really is a worship school. We call it a music academy because we so emphasize the musical part, but it really is a worship school. That's right. We want to empower uh, young musicians and singers to be able to utilize their gift to not just uh, create great music, but also change the atmosphere. And speaking of worship, songs, and inspiration, I want to invite you guys to head over to the Hub tonight at 6 p.m. The artists on the Fully Alive album will be over there. They will do a little taste and see. They will play some of their songs. They'll be interviewed, um, and you can meet them, and they'll sign your Fully Alive CD. So I want to invite you to go over to the Hub 6 p.m. tonight for the Fully Alive Song Cafe. And you really want to check this out. I sat and listened to each of their songs recently, and I was truly touched by the theological depth and yet the relevant language to express God's love for us and our interaction with him, truly some of the best songs I've ever heard. So we are going to break out to the breakout sessions right now. So I'm just going to go over it again and then you guys can head out to the big sign over there. <laughs> so Forerunner Messengers, Isaac Bennett will be teaching and it'll be here in the main room. Israel and Revi Revival will be in room 2505. Worship and prayer in room 3501, and gospel and culture in room 3501 and with that Dr. One, Michael Brown. Yeah, Dr. Michael Brown is here with us, and he will be hosting that one, so you don't want to miss. All of these are amazing, and uh, so right here we'll have Isaac Bennett joining us with a, uh, the topic of Foreigner Messengers. Okay, we're going to take a moment, just go ahead and transition to your breakouts, and Isaac Bennett right here on the Forerunner message. Isaac really carries this message with clarity, and feel free to sit down up here if you want to. Some folks want to be sitting up on the carpet, that's your, that's, it's, it's okay to do that if you'd like to do that in this afternoon session. Now, IHOP began 19, 18 years ago, and Isaac was only 15 years old, and he joined us as 15-year-old, yeah. and you've been here the whole 18 years. Yeah. And this young musician that was full on involved, of course, you're Abby's older brother, right. and Abby, who sang last night, she was only like 12 or something, or nine or four or something. Yeah. I remember her being little, but... 
Isaac has been uh, is is uh, been in our leadership team for many years over the last 18 because he's got a marvelous teaching gift, and he has a tremendous clarity. But you got this humor that is I don't want to encourage it because you're you got you're so easy at it, but you got this humor along with practicality and insight, and so I think that. You breaking down some of this forerunner messaging thing is going to be a real practical thing. I'm going to pray for you. Thank Lord, you. I thank you for Isaac and his 18 years here, since his teenage years, being on worship teams and teaching and training. And I just ask for the spirit of wisdom and revelation to flow through him. And Lord, that you would st- release uh, this forerunner calling stronger uh, an impart- impartation upon the people in these afternoon sessions, these next three afternoons. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Now, I'm going to take one more moment and ask you to go ahead and slip out quietly if you would, because I'd like Isaac to jump right in, but I know it's a little distracting while everybody's moving around. I do youth ministry. You do youth ministry, so you're okay at it. Okay, there you go. I'm pretty used to the distraction. I've done youth ministry a long time, so I've had all sorts of wild things happening while I'm talking or speaking and just kind of plowed through anyway. So it'll be hard to surprise me. And for the surprises, we have security. So anyway, all right. I think there was an announcement made that I was gonna be in room 2500, but clearly I'm not there, I'm here. So I need help uh, getting our small group discussion teams for afterwards back in this room. Those of you that need to do that, That would be amazing. Okay, Um, turn in your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 40. This is where we're gonna start uh, this afternoon. Um, But we're really gonna move through a bunch of different scriptures because we're going to be touching on uh, two different themes that are gonna be evident as we approach the end of the age, leading up to the return of Jesus to the earth. There's two emerging themes that we're gonna touch on today. They are not comprehensive themes by any means, but they are definitely in the Bible, so rest easy, especially if you're Baptist. Uh, Just relax, they are in the Word of God. So, I'm gonna pray again. Let's just take a moment and dial in and just focus on Jesus. I mean, he's really the reason that we're here. Today, I'm so honored to be with you here. Uh, My wife, my children are here out in the room and uh, I love them so dearly. We have five kids and a dog, so it's just, uh, it's a wild time at the Bennett house. Um, Let's pray. Father, we ask that your spirit would come to this room in an increased way. Lord, I ask that you would help me to rightly communicate the glory of your son, the coming of your beautiful son, Jesus, his return, the events surrounding that return. Lord, we ask for a spirit of wisdom and revelation. We ask you, Lord, that you would take the weakness of my words and that you would accelerate them by the spirit into hearts. Lord, the many in this room that you are calling out this weekend, you are marking them for this message. You are calling them out in the midst of this generation to be a voice, to prepare the way of the Lord. I ask that you, your hand would rest upon them in an increased way. In your name, O oh Lord, we pray and we all said amen. Okay, look at verse five in Isaiah 40. And if you're like me, you like to have a notebook out to the side. Like I mentioned, we're gonna touch several different verses during this time. And I realize that we do have a short amount of time and this is a very large topic. But I'm gonna do my best to really bring forth kind of uh, this centralized idea that As we approach the day of the Lord, there's going to be two attributes or two trends that are gonna emerge and they're gonna fill the earth. The first one is that the glory of the Lord, the glory of Christ, is going to emerge in the last generation in a very unique and unprecedented way. And we're gonna cover some of those themes. The second trend that we're gonna look at is the rise of deception in the end of the age, and how Jesus warns his people against deception. It's actually the number one warning that he charges us with as believers 
as we approach the day of the Lord is to not be deceived. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at the relationship between these two things. As the glory increases, deception will also increase. And these two attributes or characteristics, they're inextricably linked together. They're by the Lord, it's intentional that they're linked together as this season of time culminates with the return of Jesus. Now in Isaiah 40 verse five, the prophet Isaiah says this. He says that the glory of the Lord is going to be revealed and that all flesh will see it together. Everybody say the word all. All, when the Lord says all in the Bible, he really means all. When he says through the prophet Isaiah in this passage that all flesh will see the glory of the Lord, he really means that all flesh will see the glory of the Lord revealed. And then he goes on and he says, the mouth of the Lord has spoken in the second part of the verse. In other words, the fact that God's glory is gonna be seen across every nation of the earth before his coming, has been confirmed by the very words of God himself. And when God says something, when he writes it in his word, you know for sure that it is going to happen. The word of God is true, and it is unfailing, and it is sure, and just as the Lord spoke to his prophets about the first coming of Jesus, in a similar manner, he's spoken about the second coming, and he says, my word has confirmed this. When I say all flesh will see my glory, he goes, I really mean it. I really mean it. During this time, all of the nations, all of the peoples, I mean, Think about how many out of the way islands there are and you know, people way up north living in Alaska. Is there anybody from Alaska here? Come on. <laughs> there are so many out of the way places. When I read this verse, it strikes me to the, I mean, just crazy amount of effort the Lord is going to go through to show every person and display to every person on the earth his glory before his coming. It is very unique. The word of God is bursting with details concerning that generation that will see him. And you've probably heard this many times and you'll hear it many more times, but over 150 chapters in the Bible that the main topic is emphasizing the generation of the Lord's return. And in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, related to his first coming, he only gave us 89 chapters to document his first coming. And he gave us over 150 chapters to document and tip us off and give us rich and vibrant detail concerning his second coming. And we need to be aware of this as the people of God because we love him. Why do we care about this? Well, I believe that scripture indicates that before the coming of the Lord, he's going to raise up witnesses, people like you, across the nations of the earth, and they're gonna walk like John the Baptist walked. They're gonna have a message and a ministry that prepares people for the revealing of this glory, the revealing of this beauty, that we are going to see, possibly in our generation. And the Lord is gonna raise up these voices, and I believe that the Lord is doing it now in our generation. And like I said earlier, I work with teenagers a lot, and I believe that the Lord is marking even 15 and 16 year olds with this message of his coming, and they are gonna give themselves to studying the word of God, like what Richie was talking about here just a minute, minute ago. They're gonna give themselves to prayer and fasting and radical obedience to Jesus, and they are not going to quit until the people know that there is a God in heaven, and he has a son, and that son is coming to the planet to establish a kingdom on the earth. And the prayer that Christ prayed in Matthew chapter six, let your kingdom come, let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, that will happen in the generation before his return. There's two other reasons that we need to know this message and why is it important to us. 
Number one, it is necessary. It is necessary because during the first coming of Christ, the peoples did not recognize the day of their visitation. They ignored it. They looked at the prophetic scriptures, but they did not have understanding of the day that they were in. And Jesus is going, these scriptures, they testify of me. And he actually rebuked the people in that day because they had no understanding of the time of their visitation. And if we are to experience the time of visitation before the coming of the Lord, then it would be very wise of us to familiarize ourselves with these passages, to pray through them, to talk with them about friends, to talk with them about the communities that we come from so that we are prepared for the day of his coming. Number two, there is an appropriate response for the day of the Lord. When God says, I'm going to move in power in your generation and I'm going to reveal my beauty and glory across the whole earth, there is an appropriate response that actually affects us when we walk out of this room uh, uh, after Sunday evening. There is a response that the Lord wants his people to walk in and engage with. Now we come to these conferences, we get energized, we hear messages that move our heart, we get touched by the Holy Spirit, we hear new insightful things, but it's not enough to just live in the excitement of the message, yay, Jesus is coming. There is, in the Bible, an appropriate response in light of that information. You can imagine if you knew that in 15 years the Civil War was coming. Imagine that you lived in the 1800s and you knew by the word of the Lord that the Civil War is coming. You would live very differently than if you had no idea that it was coming. And in a similar way, the Lord wants us to live with a sharpness, with an intentionality, with a devotion to Jesus as the darkness increases, that we would not be caught off guard by these unique dynamics that are gonna hit the earth before the coming of the Lord. There are two notable features that will mark this time. I mentioned these earlier, and this is what we're gonna talk about. The glory of the Lord will increase and be revealed across the earth. And then secondly, darkness and specifically deception are going to increase. They're going to, both of them are going to come to fullness in that generation of the Lord's return. Central to the agenda of the Lord in the end of the age. And we're gonna talk on these, a couple of these themes of glory just for a few moments. Central to the agenda of the Lord and the end of the age is his resolve that the nations of the earth would see Jesus as glorious, or you could put the word beautiful there, that they would look at Christ, that they would think of him in their mind, even before they see him with their eyes, that they would think of Jesus and that they would give glory and worship to him. This is one of the premier agendas on the heart of the Lord as it pertains to the end of the age. Now what happens when the glory of the Lord is revealed to a generation? And scripture many times shows us the response of the people, what actually happens when God's glory shows up. I think of the, the book of Exodus. When the people of Israel go out into the wilderness, they've been freed from the slavery and the bondage of Egypt. They go out into the wilderness and they're there and God comes down on a mountain. Exodus 24 says that the glory of God descends on a mountain called Sinai. When God came down on the mountain, what happened when that event took place, and that was a real event. The glory of the Lord, the, the, that storm, that fiery storm that surrounds the throne of God in Revelation four and five actually descended from heaven, and in Exodus 24, you can read it yourself, and the people of God that were standing at the foot of the mountain, they looked up the mountain, they saw God's glory resting on the mountain. And the people of God, they were afraid, they trembled. They go, that's not God, we don't wanna go up there, we want nothing to do with that. 
And they looked at Moses and they said, Moses, you go up there for us. We don't want anything to do with that. They were, now, now to put that in perspective, that means that the people of God were so taken off guard by the revelation of the glory of God that they actually wanted nothing to do with it when he actually came. You know, I think of the many prayer meetings and across college campuses and houses of prayer and churches and youth groups in this nation and we're crying out for the glory of God. I mean, what would happen if God's glory actually began to descend upon this nation? And it is a terrifying thought to me that we would maybe have a similar response as the people of Israel. We'd look at the glory of God and go, I want nothing to do with that. We'd get offended and we'd go, hey, Moses, you know, leader, pastor, whoever you are, you go into the glory, but that is just not the way that I want to relate to God. That's why on the front end, it is so important that we begin to understand the person and the character and the nature of God so that when his glory is revealed across the nations of the earth, we are not offended. We don't end up in deeper idolatry like the children of Israel did. They go, hey, the glory of God's up there. Let's make a golden calf down here. I mean, how delusional is that response? but that we would see the glory of God and like Moses, we would go up the mountain and in Exodus 33, Moses begins to cry out the Lord, to the Lord. He begins to say, show me your glory. I want more of who you are, not less. I want more of who you are. And I think as we cry out for the glory of God, many times we may not even know what we're asking for. He might come in a way that is so different, so unique, so powerful, so outside of our grid of understanding, so beyond our experience that even we, even the faithful that are in this room and, and beyond, run the risk of being offended at God, being confused by the revelation of his glory. When we think of the end of the age, the main thing that should come to our mind is the person of Christ and his glorification in the nations of the earth. That is the thing that should come to our mind. Often we think of the end of the age and we're flooded with images of, you know, some guy with horns and he's got a cape, his name's the Antichrist and he's like trying to hide the horns so no one knows who he is and there's war and explosions everywhere and it's really dark and, and, and all of these images kind of flood our mind. But the central character, the central person in the end of the age before his coming is the person of Christ. His beauty, his glory, his nature, his character, and we want to be consumed, I mean absolutely consumed with him because that is the way that we endure what is coming during that time. There is no other way. There is no other option or some other strategy as we imagine ourselves in those times, in those perilous times, in those days of darkness, we have to see that Christ, the revelation of who he is, really is the safest place. And beloved, we have time now to throw ourselves into this. There is revelation to be had. There are riches to be had. You're sitting on a gold mine of riches concerning the nature of God. We need to delve into these things. We need to uh, train and equip young people to do the same. We need to tell our children. It needs to flood our mind and our dreams. We need to be consumed with the person of Christ. Amen? In that day, Christ will be seen as the preeminent one. Colossians 1. I'll just read this to you. For by him all things were created in heaven and earth. He is before all things and in him all things consist. He is the head of the body, the firstborn from, uh, from the dead, that in all things he may have preeminence. And that word preeminence means that he would be the chief love. He would be seen as the premier beauty in all of the earth. 
That means that every idol, every person, everything that is not him needs to come down and be subservient to the man, Christ Jesus. And this is his agenda for our generation and the generations following us before his coming, that he would be seen as preeminent. He deeply, deeply cares about this, and he wants us to care about it in the way that he cares about it. Now, when he reveals his glory and trouble, or uh, when he reveals his glory in the earth, it's gonna cause great shaking. The Bible refers to God as this all consuming fire. This all consuming fire. And, you know, sometimes we come to our worship times and we're just kind of sitting there like, oh, Lord, just lavish the peaches and cream of heaven upon my head. And sometimes we could forget that our God is an all consuming fire. That means if you're where God is, everything that is not of Him is going to burn up. That's actually one of the titles for him. In Malachi 3, he goes, I'm gonna send my refiner's fire to the earth. He goes, I'm gonna purge away all of the filth, all of the goofiness, all of the idolatry, all the immorality and the sin and the opinions and blah, 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 blah. He goes, I'm gonna purge it all and I'm gonna exalt my son above every other name. And every person, whether they believe in him or not, whether they receive him or not, every knee is gonna bow. When the name of Christ is mentioned, every knee is gonna come down from every tribe, every tongue, every language, every religion, every philosophical ideal. It doesn't matter at the name of Christ. God the Father will glorify his son in this way. It is glorious. And so what better response can we have now than to just throw ourselves completely into who he is. I mean, really give ourselves to it. I believe that every person was designed by God to be radical, and everybody is radical for something. Somebody's radical for media, somebody's radical for sports, somebody's radical for their you know, relationship with their boyfriend or girlfriend or whatever. Everybody's radical. Some people are just radical for boredom. That's just what they do and what they spend all their time doing. Why not just point that desire to be radical and to be fascinated at the beautiful man, Jesus, give ourselves wholly to him, actually be used of him in the nations of the earth, die to ourselves, die to our dreams so that he can be glorified because that's where it's all going anyway. There is no other option. The, and there is no choose your own story adventure. There is no plan B. This is how it will play out. Jesus standing alone, glorified, and every knee in the room bowing before him going, you are glorious. We were way wrong at about, uh, you know, 15 things, 100 things. Now, as the glory of God increases in the earth, and as his, the knowledge of the glory of God, Habakkuk 2 tells us that the knowledge of the glory of God is gonna fill the earth like the waters cover the sea, there is going to be an unprecedented increase of deception in the earth. And as the glory of God increases, the deception is going to increase. There was a, there is a sociologist named Christian Smith. And what he did was, in 2005, about 12 years ago, he surveyed American teenagers, and what he did was he began to conclude and come to, uh, began to study what our young people really believe about Christianity. Why am I saying that now? Because many of you in the room are about 25 years old, so this is about 10 years ago, 12 years ago, whatever, and we are now, many of us, we are caught in some of these things. And as I read this study, I recently came across it, I was struck, and I was struck at what many of my peers believe, what many young people believe, and the way that they walk out their Christianity, and the way that they believe and talk about Jesus and relate to God. And here's what they came to. They said, the only way that we could kind of summarize this, and they gave this fancy title to it, and I'm not fancy or whatever, but I'm just gonna tell you what it is. It's called moralistic therapeutic deism. Okay, that's a big term. Here's what that means. Here are the five major tenets of what that means. 
Number one, they believe that God, there's a God who exists, he created the world, and he watches over human life on the earth. All right, that's not, that's not too bad. Number two, God wants people to be good, nice, and fair to each other as taught in the Bible and other world religions. Okay, now we're kind of making God sound like a kindergarten teacher. Number three, the central goal of life is to be happy and feel good about oneself. Now this is, this is a survey, and they're going, what do you believe about Christianity? Why does God exist? They're asking him all these questions, and these were the, conclusion, uh, the conclusions that they drew, these sociologists. Number four, God does not need to be particularly involved in anyone's life except when he's needed to resolve a problem. Ouch. When, when our life is confronted with a problem, that's the only time that we need God. When there is a tragedy, when the bill is late, when the relationship is on the rocks, that's the only time that those that subscribe to this you know, value system, that's the only time they actually seek God. Is only in the now we should seek God in the moment of trouble. That's not what I'm talking about. But they only are seeking God when things are getting really tough. I talk with young people all the time, and they're telling me their woes and you know all these things. And I'm in this dry season, and my life is falling apart. And da da da. And I go, hey, maybe God is trying to get your attention actually through the trouble in your life. Maybe he wants you to actually cry out to him. Do you think that God could allow trouble into your life to see if you would actually turn to him, if you would call upon his name and invite you into something deeper? Anyway, the fifth thing is this. Good people go to heaven when they die. Now all of these, to varying degrees, they're almost like biblical language, but they're really not. They're really not the revelation or the truth of God. And this is the predominant Western expression and belief system of Christianity from these young people. And now we've grown up and now we're all in the room together 10 years, 12 years later. And God wants to, I believe, blow this idea out of the water. And I believe that we are in a season that God is calling his people back to his word, back to a biblical expression of Christianity where God doesn't exist to just make my life better and more successful and give me the spouse I want and give me the house I want and give me the payroll I want. God exists because he is the creator of heaven and earth. And I'm not here to fit God into my plan. I have to look at how do I fit into God's plan. Do you know that we've, as believers, we've been adopted into the family of Christ? Paul tells us in Corinthians 5 that we would no longer live for ourselves, but live for him who died for us. In other words, your story at the moment of salvation is gone, and now you've begun a new story. Ephesians 1 says, in Christ, we are in him, a part of his story now. I mean, this, this is messing me up. This is making me uncomfortable. The last three or four years, the Lord has been pressing these things upon my heart, and he's been touching my heart and challenging me and saying, Isaac, what do you actually believe about me? What do you believe about salvation? What do you believe about my coming? Do they align with my words and what I've spoken, or are you just floating around in a cultural Christianity expression, and everybody's clapping and patting ourselves on the back, and we're actually possibly, <laughs> I'll be nice, deeply deceived if we're subscribing to these ideas. Now the reason I highlight this is because this is one of the central Christian Western belief systems. That might not be your belief system. Hallelujah. But what it ultimately does is that it puts man, it puts us at the center of the story and it puts God on the peripheral. And we're living, in my opinion, in such a narcissistic generation where everything that goes on is about me, 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 me. What can I get? What do I like? What worship leader do I want to lead? What things do I want to hear? What do I want people to say about me? This didn't meet my need, and this did, and we live in this consumeristic belief kind of thing, and it's just... It's all about us. God is on the peripheral and he exists to make my life better. 
And that is just not the story of the Bible. That is just not about who God is. He is enthroned and there is one seated on the throne in Revelation chapter four. And if you noticed, everything else is happening around him. In reality, Christ is at the center and we, you and I, are actually on the peripheral glorifying him and seeking to serve him and worship him and laud him like he is actually due and worth. This is why we exist. We exist to give God his glory. Not God doesn't exist to make my life better and just make me this happy person. That is not it at all. Beloved, there is trial, there is difficulty, there is tribulation. There's a reason why the gate is narrow and there's a few that find it. And I'm burdened for this. I'm not angry about it, I'm in it. The Lord is pressing this on my heart. He's going, Isaac, the way is narrow. Are you choosing the narrow way? And I have to go back to the Lord with with trembling in my heart and I say, Lord, What is it that you've called me to? And I have to examine his words and I have to apply them to my life and I have to say, am I living a life that is worthy of the name of Christ? Or am I adding Jesus on to the Pinterest wall of my heart to make my life better, cover my salvation and get me out of eternal flames? This is intense, man. There's many deceptive teachings that are out there and I'm only just touching on this one. But there's tons. But all of them share this commonality. They put man at the center. They put him and his needs and his want and his pleasure and his da 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 da. They put all of that at the center. And God wants to flip that equation around. Jesus warned the disciples that the primary threat for believers And in the end of the age would be that of deception. Mark 13, verse four and five, his disciples ask him, they say, when will these things be and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? And Jesus tells them, he says, take heed that no one deceives you. Take heed that no one deceives you. Now when he talks about taking heed, that word actually means have a spirit of discernment. Take heed means have discernment. You have to know what is true in order to discern what is false. This is a, this is a powerful truth. I had a, a friend whose mom uh, worked at a bank and she would you know, handle money all day long, just counting it and counting it and counting it or whatever. And she, got, she could feel from the texture of the money that she was counting, she could feel what was real and what was false. She could actually pick out counterfeit money just by the feel of it. And her manager, you know, is, is there and she's like going through this stack of bills and, and, and just by touch feeling them. And she goes, this one's fake. She's going through, you know, this one's fake and this one's fake. And he's like, I don't, I don't think so. He's like, I mean, this looks real to me and da, 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 da. And she's like, no, it's, it's fake. Trust me, it's fake. And they go and do whatever test or the marker thing or whatever it is that they do on it to, to show it. And, and true enough, it was counterfeit money. See, the only way that we can know if we're not in deception is if we know what's true. We have to become so familiar with the authentic that when the counterfeit pops up, when the false teaching pops up, when the false leader pops up, when the false Christ emerges in the earth, we go, nah, that ain't true. And people are going, well, how do you know? And you go, I've been on the mountain with him. I've been to the mountain and it... I was all alone. Maybe no one was there, but I don't care. I went to the mountain with God and I've seen him and I've heard him and I've feasted on his words and I've ingested his words so that they've become part of who I am. And when I speak, his words come out. And when I look, I can see what is real and what is false. Beloved, we're not gonna figure out who the Antichrist is on YouTube. We're not. We're not gonna figure out who all the false teachers are by being on YouTube. We're gonna figure out what is real and what is false by being with the man, Christ, and this word is the revelation of who he is. We have to give ourselves to this. 
You can't wait for your leader or your pastor or your friend in your youth group that's more fiery or your college ministry that's just the, you know, they're the leader. They know God. You can't wait for them to figure it out. The call to, uh, uh, to cultivate discernment and avoid deception is to every believer upon the earth and you can enter in and I can enter in by the grace of God, hallelujah. Now as these two things, the glory and the deception arise in the earth, they're related together, why? Why is it glory that's gonna fill the earth and why did Jesus warn of deception? And it goes all the way back to the garden. And we're not gonna take a ton of time on this, but it goes back to the garden and the fall of man. And Paul tells us in Romans chapter one, and you need to turn there in your Bible if, you're, if you have it, but in Romans chapter one, Paul tells us that man's original fall was because he turned from the glory of God and began to worship something else. That is the central issue that is the essence of sin it's that man and we as the children of man have turned away from the glory of God and have worshiped something that was not God he substituted man substituted their own glory for God's glory that's it, that's where the story all began. And what began with the fall of man in Genesis is gonna come to fullness in the book of Revelation and before the return of the Lord. When God chose to manifest his glory, we got Jesus, John 1. He is the manifestation of the glory of God. When God reveals his glory, we see Christ. And when man reveals his glory, we will see the Antichrist, deception. God reveals his glory to the earth. And we get this humble Jewish carpenter who's also a king with eyes like fire who washes our feet and yet slays the Antichrist with the breath of his mouth. Oh my goodness. When man says, I'm gonna display my glory, deception rises and we get the Antichrist, a wicked ruler who will bring into captivity the nations of the earth and force him to worship them, even though he is a mortal man. And these two powers are, are juxtaposed to one another. They're, they're in contention with one another and they're both rising in the earth before that day. So let's look back at Romans 1. For though they knew God, I'm reading from verse 21, they did not glorify him. See, we're on this issue of glory. This is the central issue. God is deserving of glory and nothing else is. Worship, okay? He says they did not give thanks. But verse 22, professing to be wise, they became fools. And here's the phrase, verse 23. They exchanged the glory of an incorruptible God for an image. It was idolatry. It was the turning away of the beautiful God who's seated in heaven and turning to a lesser thing. And for many, and for, I believe for Adam and Eve, they were turning to themselves. They were wanting their own glory. They were wanting to be like God, if you remember the story of the serpent and Eve. Now, that's the, that's the word I want you to focus in on. They exchanged the glory of God for an image. Now, in the end of the age, there is a figure that is going to emerge in the earth. And this figure is the antithesis, or he's the opposite of the glory of Christ. Humanity was created to glorify God and in the end of the age there's gonna be this culmination of deception and the world is gonna be swept into, uh, into that deception and they're going to begin to glorify this man. He's the antithesis of the glory of God. God is the one who will raise him up. Why? Because it's what humanity wants. 
God, it's God that is going to allow the Antichrist to emerge in the earth as the culmination of deception. And what God is going to do is he's going to show the foolishness of the ways of man, a central, a man central belief system. And he's going to put it to shame when he reveals a Christ God centered belief system. Do you see? And these two, they're, they're in contention with one another and they're both arising at the exact same time. As this deception increases in the earth, it is a culmination of human agreement to exchange the glory of God. It's a culmination of human agreement to exchange the glory of God. They're going, we don't want your ways. We don't want your laws. We don't want your demands. We don't want to deny ourselves and take up a cross. We don't want to humble ourselves to you. And so what began in the garden with this deception of exchanging the glory of God is going to culminate with the Antichrist where they will exchange it for what they believe is the best way, a man, a man-centric belief system. It's the full expression of what happened in the garden. Now you remember back in Romans verse 23 that we were looking at, Romans 1, 23, where man exchanged the glory of God for an image. Now look at Revelation 13, verse 14. I'll just, I'll read it to you. You don't have to turn there. The false prophet in verse 14, he is going to deceive. Again, there's that theme of deception. Those who dwell on the earth because of the signs that this man will perform in front of the nations of the earth. Now God will perform his signs in the earth through his church. And the Antichrist is going to perform his signs in the earth. And people are going to be so confused. They will not know which one is God and which, one, which one's right and which one's wrong. Many will not. But we can know. Now this anti, uh, the Antichrist, here he's being lauded by this other, his right hand man called the false prophet. And the false prophet is gonna tell those on the earth, now here's the word, to make an image of the Antichrist, to make a statue of him or some form of, of statue. He's going to create an image. So Paul, back in Romans 1, he's going, the original fall came because they got their eyes off of God and onto an image, and at the end of the age, there's gonna be a culmination, and the nations are gonna get all, their eyes off of God and onto an image. It's the exact same thing. It's the exact same thing. And the glory of God and deception, they're rising in the earth. And beloved, we have time now, and I don't know how much time we have, it might be 10 years, it might be 50 years, but we have time now to become so familiar with the true, to give ourselves so wholeheartedly to Jesus that we avoid the deception that is coming in that day because it will be powerful and it will affect us and our children and our children's children, you know, should the Lord tarry or whatever, but there is a call for us to respond in godliness and humikeness and meekness now and not be swept away by the spirit of the age that is conditioning many for deception in that hour. The Lord is going to rise in judgment over the earth because of this global exchange. What's the exchange? They did not glorify God, but they glorified an image, a man. They put all of their stake in a man. The kings of the earth, they are going to tremble when the Lord begins to reveal his glory. Because again, he is so zealous for his own glory and for his own name that he will not allow the nations to continue in their deception. He will arise in the earth and he will begin to shake the earth and I think there's literal shaking to that, like earthquakes and things the Bible talks about. But I think it means that he challenges mindsets and institutions and economies and neighborhoods and leaders. He shakes it. We say, uh, often here we say, he is going to shake everything that can be shaken. And I absolutely believe that. 
I absolutely, because here's, a, here's, a, here's an idea. When you get saved, is it not because God has shaken your life, all forms of your life? He doesn't send you an earthquake to shake you, but he wakes you up. He challenges you. He challenges your views of yourself. He calls us to repentance. He calls us to humble ourselves before him. He shakes us. And on that similar way, he's gonna shake all of the nations of the earth in that day. Isaiah verse two, or chapter two, verses 10 and 19. Enter into the rock and hide in the dust from the terror of the Lord. Now this is the exhortation to the leaders and the kings in that day. From the terror of the Lord and the glory of his majesty. There's that term again, his glory is coming. And the kings, the leaders, the nations of the earth, they're going to shake because of that glory. And they're gonna go, the only way to fix this, the only solution that we see is to put all of our stake in this man, this image, named the Antichrist. Verse 19, they will go into the holes of the rocks and into the caves of the earth. And this is talking about literal, they're, they're really hiding from the Lord in that day. That's not just a, you know, kind of parabolic language. They're actually going, you are shaking the earth. There's judgments that are touching my nation, my region, and they're going, the only way that I can escape this is to go and hide in actual caves and in holes in the earth. What are they hiding from? They're hiding from the Lord and the glory of his majesty. That's in verse 19. When he arises to shake the earth mightily. So we can see that there is this agenda in the heart of God that glory would increase. And there is this propensity in the heart of man to turn from the glory of God and fixate on another image. We call that an idol. And the Lord is going to come. He's going to shake the earth in the context of those dynamics. He is going to absolutely rattle every leader, every person, and confront the earth with this central issue. Jesus is glorious and beautiful. What are you going to do because of him? How will you respond in light of him and his power? Who can resist God? Who can resist a man that's already risen from the dead? Who can resist a man that holds the earth in the palm of his hand? Who can resist a man whose mouth and breath can destroy armies and cause hills to smoke just by touching them? Who can resist him? And the nations will be brought into this valley of decisions, pe people. I don't mean just nations like flags and governments. I'm talking about people, us. And we will be confronted with the glory of Christ's majesty as he's revealed even before his coming and into the end of the age and his return. How do we resist deception? The Lord is so kind to us. He gives us so much insight. He's like a pastor. I mean, he, not like, he is. He's the shepherd. I love it. You have these intense passages, like Matthew 24 is an example, and it's, you know, the abomination of desolation is coming. And then he's like, hey, if you have, uh, you know, little children and stuff, it's gonna be harder to get away in that day. And people are like, spiritualize, what does that mean? Like, nursing babes, like, well, that's gotta mean, like, you know, spiritual provision and da-da-da and all this stuff. And he's like, no, 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 I'm literally being a pastor to you right now. And when the Antichrist is revealed in the Middle East, he goes, you gotta run away from him, and if you have a baby, it's gonna be harder. And the Lord is so pastoral to us and so kind. He doesn't just give us these huge framework ideas. I will arise and shake the earth mightily. And we're like, what do we do? And he's like, oh, you'll figure it out. <laughs> you know, Get out there, Junior. You'll be fine. He's so kind to us. He's going to lead us like a shepherd. The shepherd doesn't abandon the sheep. He leads them. He, Yea, through I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. You're with me. He's gonna lead us. He's gonna lead his people. And he tells us in Mark 13, he goes, okay, in light of this, the deception and my glory that are filling the earth, this is what he says in verse 33. He says, take heed, there's that charge again to have spiritual discernment. He goes, watch and pray 
You don't know when the time is, and that's kind of the part that we a lot of times gravitate toward. Well, we just don't know the time. We don't know the time, so it doesn't matter. But let's fixate on these two words right here. Watch and pray to live in this spiritual sobriety with an awareness of the plan of God and his purposes. We can actually do this. You can do it. I can do it. Your children can do it. We can live a lifestyle of prayer and watchfulness according to the word of God. We can familiarize ourselves with the Bible. We can know the voice of Christ, our shepherd. We don't have to live confused and deceived and just kind of trying to figure it out on the go. He goes, this is what you need to do in light of all this. I want you to watch and pray. I want you to watch and pray. I want you to be vigilant over your own soul. I want you to be vigilant over the soul of your communities. He goes, I want you to watch in my word as these events unfold so that you can have confidence and be a voice of clarity and understanding in those days, not lost in the sea of confusion. We can do this. Jesus exhorts us to, but here's the thing. This is the catch. This is the real catch. It is very costly to do this. It is, it is not cheap. It's free to do this, but it is absolutely not cheap to give your life to the forerunner message, to be a voice, to know the word of God, to prepare your heart, prepare your spirit for that day. It is free because it's available in the word of God, but it is absolutely not cheap. It will, con- it will take your time, it will take money, it will take effort, and, and what's even more difficult is it will take saying no to other opportunities for the sake of giving yourself all the way into this. You have to say no to other opportunities because they will come. If right now you're in a season of life, I mean, I'm kind of just saying this jokingly, but you know, if you're in a season of life where you're like, I've got no opportunities, Just go into an intensely consecrated season of giving yourself to prayer and fasting in the word. I guarantee you, millions of opportunities will show up. But you can't take them. You know, set aside three months, six months, and say, I'm gonna say no to some social life. Just some, not all of it, don't get weird. I'm just saying, say no to some of it and begin to give yourself to this and you will see how the enemy will be so resistant against you and he will try and lure you out, lure, lure you out with temptation through opportunities and fun things that you have fear of missing out and all this stuff. It's crazy. It's crazy. We do uh, every month at IHOP KC, we do a three-day fast at the beginning of the month called the Global Bridegroom Fast. Our whole community is you know, invited together to fast and pray and press into the Lord. And it's just those three days and we tell everybody, you know, don't do as many meetings, just kind of shut everything down. Let's be before the Lord in the prayer room and all of that. I can't tell you, there is more opportunities for free lunch, free Kansas City barbecue, cool leaders that are in town, and people that want to meet with you and hang out and go see cool movies that just came out and pay for you than when those three days pop up every month. I, I don't know what it is. I mean, Corey, you, you know this, this is true. It is inexplicable when you devote yourself to one thing you will have just a barrage of not just negative things happen to you you will have tons of positive opportunities to get you out of this but there's only one way to cultivate spiritual discernment there's only one way to give yourself all the way to the glory of Jesus and it's to do the word of God fasting prayer, the word, singing, intentionality. I mean, all of that, that is what it takes and no one can do it for you and no one can do it for me. I wish it worked that way. I wish, you know, Mike and the team, they could just put their hands on my head and just pray and then boom, I would just get all of this stuff downloaded to my mind. That would be awesome. It doesn't happen like that. It doesn't happen like that. I wish, you know, Corey would just pray for me and I'd have, you know, more passion in the place of intercession and fasting and and all the things that he's given himself. It doesn't work like that. You can't exchange it. You have to go get it yourself. You have to give yourself to this. And I wanna challenge some of you in the room right now. You might be 15 or, or 50 years old. It doesn't matter. But maybe the Lord is touching your heart on some of these things. 
Maybe you're intrigued by some of these things in the Bible or maybe you're just mad at what I'm saying. I don't know. Lord moves in all sorts of ways. <laughs> but I wanna challenge us as a people to begin to count the cost and begin to live a life in response to the plan of God. Listen to what I said, not just get excited about the plan of God, but live a life in response to the plan of God. Actually respond. In John and Jesus' day, there was an actual response that was necessary. It was repent and get baptized. There was an actual response. And today, as we read the word of God, as we look at these things concerning his plan, as we read, you know, Mark 13, 33, watch it. There's a real response that we can go do when we leave this conference, when we drive back home to Alaska. If you drove from Alaska, man, bless you. But I wanna take just a moment and I wanna pray for you. I wanna pray for anyone in the room and then, uh, and then after that we're gonna be splitting up and we have discussion groups to talk about some of these themes and kind of process them and ask questions to some of our leaders that are gonna be here. But if that's you, if the Lord is touching your heart concerning some of these things and you're going, you know what? I wanna say yes to the glory of God at a deeper level. I wanna avoid deception and I really wanna press into some of these things in a more intentional way. Wherever you are, I wanna invite you to stand just for a moment. We don't have a ministry team. We don't have music. You don't want me to sing over you. But uh, just wherever you're at, just stand up. This is between you and the Lord. This is between you and the Lord. Well, Father, we love you and we love your son. Lord, we love when Jesus is glorified. Father, we ask that you would move in a deeper way in those that are feeling your presence, that are being stirred on these themes from your word, that are being called into a deeper response, a deeper commitment, a, a pressing in. Lord, those that were, are willing to count the cost, Lord, I ask that you would help us, give us grace to count the cost. Because the cost really at the end of the day is actually saying no to things more than just saying yes and, and adding this in to the buffet line of our life. But to actually say no to things, that's where the sting is. That's where the cost is to go deep in these themes. Lord, we ask you that you would raise up a whole generation of moms and dads, young and old, our children. Lord, we ask that you would mark them with this message of the glory of Christ and his glory being seen all across the nations of the earth. Lord, I ask that you would consume a generation with it, that we would wake up in the morning with the zeal and the drive to make your name great in the nations of the earth to make your name great in our workplace, to make your name great in our high school or our college or our church ministry or our neighborhood, Lord, that we would be consumed with your glory. Come, Lord, and touch our hearts. Touch our hearts, Lord. We ask for a spirit of revelation to rest upon us, Lord, as we draw nearer to that day. We ask for a spirit of revelation that would ruin us and say, I've got no other options. I just need you, God. I need your word. It is a lamp unto my feet. It is the bread of life that feeds my spirit, my soul, and I am going to give myself wholeheartedly to this. Lord, I ask for 10,000 in our nation that would walk in this in power. Many more than that across the nations of the earth, but Lord, do it. Mark a generation. Call them unto yourself. Call us, Lord. Give us courage. Give us boldness to say hard things, to live a fasted lifestyle, to press in in fasting and in prayer. Lord, to do what is countercultural, what is unpopular, what is frowned upon and rejected by, by many. But Lord, we ask for a spirit of courage and boldness. 
We want to stand with Jesus in the day of your appearing. We want to be faithful to who you are in that day. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.